Hello, I'm Manoj Karmakar. Welcome to ISSPS TV. If you like any of our videos, do remember to click the like and share button. If you are new to this channel, do remember to subscribe so that you can get regular notifications of any future uploads. Now, uh, now that we are able to uh, perform uh, neuraxial uh, scanning, let's look at uh, how we can use it to perform interventions. Now, I would at the very outset mention that neuraxial intervention using ultrasound is the most difficult ultrasound guided intervention that you will ever perform. So you can't become an expert doing just 10, 15 blocks like you can do with brachial plexus. In fact, there are some blocks where you can say that you do one, you can teach one. But this is a learning process that will evolve over many years with experience. But by paying attention to what I'm going to say in the next 25, 30 minutes, I'm sure it will cut your journey down to try and do this intervention more objectively because we have learned it the hard way and we do, uh, we've been doing this for many years now, more than 15 years, if you may. So again, I have no conflict of interest whatsoever relating to this presentation. Now, when you look at real-time ultrasound guidance for central neuraxial blocks, the question really is, okay, I don't really don't deserve to stand next to them. So this is Corning and uh, Beer. And as we alluded to, they actually described these uh, epidurals and spinals. Now, I'm not really, um, I'm repeating this, I know that. But I like you to note that this really happened in the 1800s, in the late 1800s, okay? Uh, and subsequently, Mario Dogliotti, Achille Mario Dogliotti from Italy, actually he is not an anesthesiologist. History says he, is, he was a surgeon. Now it's interesting how surgeons are, were often involved with many of the innovations in, in, in anesthesiology, but at the time, Anesthesia was an evolving specialist, and I believe this may be because surgeons who used to be doing everything. They used to give the anesthesia and probably do the surgery too at the same time. But anyway, let's move on. So this Dogliotti actually described their loss of resistance technique in 1933. So late, eight, late 1800s and then 1933. So that's a very relevant. It was only in, in the early 2000 when Dr. Thomas Grau actually published his experience in the use of ultrasound for epidurals and spinals. And I alluded to that in my previous presentation. This is Dr. Grau here. He is at the inaugural ISSPS in, in 2009 in this, in this picture with some of uh, the participants when he's conducting a workshop. Now let's take a look at real-time ultrasound guided central neuraxial blocks. As I alluded to, Dogliotti described the loss of resistance technique in 1933. Now today, if you review the literature, there is actually a paucity of data. It's not as popular as performing ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks. Nevertheless, several different techniques have been described in the literature, in the sitting position, lateral position, prone position, in plane, out of plane, non-dependent, dependent, etc., in needle insertion. So it may be fair to say there are no really optimal techniques described that we should be following. So the question is, why is real-time neuraxial block, central neuraxial block not as popular? I think it boils down again to the high success rate of landmark-based techniques. We seem to have accepted that 5% failure rate is an acceptable failure. And uh, because it landmark-based techniques offers low rate of complication. That's perfectly good, and it applies to all our clinical practice, whether you are in Asia, whether you are in South America, or whether you are in Africa or in the United States. Now, there are a lot of uh, literature available today, and these are some of the meta-analysis that have been uh, published, and in fact, some of them actually hot of the press. Now, when I collate this information for you, I may summarize saying that pre-procedural scans are more frequently performed because it accurately identifies a given lumbar interspace. It accurately identifies the midline. It allows to predict the depth to the dura, 
Uh, a pre-procedural scan in some literature indicates that it reduces the needle punctures and increases the first pass success. But there are also data which says that randomized and good quality data that says that it may not actually improve technical success or increase the first pass success. It's, these are more relevant when you look at difficult patients. This is where the importance of ultrasound is, when you have a difficult spine or an obese. So if you're looking at a young individual, whether you do it landmark or with ultrasound, it probably does not make a difference. But when you are having a difficult spine, that's where it usually will make a difference. And as I alluded to, a pre-procedural scan prior to your landmark-based technique may reduce the incidence of um, bloody tap or even postpartum headache and backache. Now, this is another uh, study comparing landmark versus procedure, pre-procedure ultrasound for neuraxial intervention as a systematic review. And these investigators in a non-obstructive population showed that actually it did not enhance the first pass success and increase the total time that it takes. So that means it doesn't improve success, but it actually increases the time. But they were very generous in mentioning that this there is an increase, which is statistically significant, but it clinically is not relevant. It's only about four or five minutes difference. Now, this is another study by Dr. Elshar Kavi from the Cleveland Clinic. I wouldn't rate this study very high, but one of the results that came out of this randomized study comparing landmark versus real time, and in fact, this may be the first study which compared real time versus landmark, is that the operators rated these real time interventions more difficult than the land than the than the landmark technique. That means ultrasound guided procedures were more difficult to perform. But then some of these operators had only done in the as per the paper, had only done about 10 or had done a minimum of 10 before they embarked on this study. Now it's time for reflection. So I think some of the data goes either way. You can make a cause for using it. You may make a cause not for using. I'm not here to try and convince you that you should be using it all the time. But I would say, what would you do when you have a patient like so? Today is not the forum when we are going to say, what do you do when you have a scoliotic patient? We will do that in one of the later, later webinars, probably the third or fourth webinar, so stay tuned. But I think these are patients that are truly challenging in our clinical practice. We have this guy real-time ultrasound-guided epidurals uh, as a single, with a single operator uh, as early as 2009. The same technique has been adopted by Dr. Chin and the group to perform spinal injection. And they successfully showed in these uh, two case reports that successful dural puncture was possible performing real-time ultrasound guided spinal in these difficult patients. As you can see here, this looks like an elderly individual who's in the sitting position with some uh, scoliosis with the uh, present and they performed the spinal injection after landmark based was difficult. As you can see here, Dr. Chin shows patient performing a paramedian sagittal scan with a, with a spinal needle. It's in the sitting position and the needle is from the dependent side. As I alluded to before, this is the spinal laminar view and Dr. Conroy and their group use this report where they performed about 100 and the success rate was 97%. Uh, and they had a, this is, um, I think, the first pass success rate in these cases. Real time spinal uh, in the prone position has also been described the L5S1. I suspect these are mostly for pain procedures uh, and uh, with a high success rate. They, this study actually comprised of cadaveric dissection in, uh, five in five cadavers where they performed the L5 or the Taylor approach, which was described by. Dr. Taylor or Mr. Taylor, uh, somewhere in the Midlands of England many years ago, performing spinals to the L5S1. And then uh, in about 10 individuals, they perform real-time spinal injections or the Taylor approach in 10 individuals with great success. Um, needle guidance using the Sono GPS or needle GPS guided 
uh, techniques have also been described in the literature. Now, while these are, appear to be useful, but they are very complicated, complex in the sense that you need extra equipment, extra special type of needles, longer spinal needles, because you need a magnetic sensor and a magnetic um, receiver uh, for the magnetic field, and then you magnetize the tip. The needle is then advanced either in plane or out of plane, and you can guide it to the to the target. So whether you insert it out of plane or in plane. Now, today we don't really know where the role of this is given the complexity that this may entail, but with experience, I'm sure Dr. Niazi and the rest have become very experienced with it. And as surgeons, as they are using navigation for many of their procedures, I think with experience, it can become easier. So you can see here, they're showing how you can perform out of plane here, as you can see, or an in-plane injection. So well, in order to make good sense of this, I would uh, take you through some of the basic considerations and then we can uh, see how you can perform these uh, neuraxial interventions using ultrasound. The first important factor is the choice of equipment. One shoe doesn't fit all. What do I mean by that? Now you're imaging a spine, which is at a depth, and there's a very narrow acoustic window. So you need an equipment which has the muscle behind it. What I mean by that is you need an equipment that allows you optimizability. I'm not proposing any equipment one over the other. As I mentioned before, I have no financial interests or have any um, conflict of interest with anybody. But my, my advice to you is if you are going to use ultrasound for neuraxial blocks, you need a equipment with lots of muscle. You can't just take a, uh, I would want of any other name. You can't just take any simple box and then fire it on and expect to see good images. And good images are paramount because if you don't have good images, then you're as blind as a bat. So you don't really uh, uh, can't do these interventions without good equipment. Fortunately, with current advances in technology, some of the portable equipments that are available in day-to-day -day practice produce exceptionally good equipment. So my advice to you is to, to test them out and then choose what applies to you, your practice best. And of course, it will also depend on how much money you are willing to spend. We've been very fortunate. We have been using some of these equipments as part of our research and equipment grants for more than 15 years now. And some of the images that you will see are actually from these uh, high-end equipments. Now, ultrasound selection, the transducer selection I should have mentioned, is that today they are ultrasound transducer, low frequency ultrasound transducer. As you can see, I put this whole array of uh, low frequency curved array transducers just to show you that they all vary in shapes and sizes and they all vary in weight. I think the latter is very important because once you start doing neuraxial interventions, you will find that the weight of the transducer doesn't matter because very soon you will start to find that there are muscles in your hand that start to ache that you've never ever used before. And thus they are now getting tired and the tire, more tired you get, the more difficult the intervention becomes so much so that it becomes a spiraling vicious cycle uh, of more needle punctures and then failure. So in order to really be able to perform ultrasound guided intervention, you have to have a very stable and strong non-dominant hand. So when my fellows join me, the first thing I do to them is I give them one of these medicine balls and I say, when you're not busy working, you should be doing this. Strengthen your non-dominant hand so that you can hold the transducer and make them um, make them much these, these intrinsic muscle more stronger. Now, when you do interventions, we recommend or we advise you don't use any ultrasound gel. Why? As you can see, this is our setup. It has changed over the years, but it's pretty much the same. This is saline, and this is the alcohol hibitin that we use. It's colored, so it don't confuse. And this is our equipment that is quite standard. Now, we don't use ultrasound gel because we don't know what ultrasound gel does to if it enters your neuraxis. I'm sure it won't do anything good, but I'm sure there's only bad thing ahead. This group, uh, Dr. 
Pintaric, etc., and colleagues demonstrated in this article that in animal models in piglets, that if any of this enters the neuraxis, it leads to a severe inflammatory response to the neuraxial spaces, as demonstrated by leukocytic infiltration and other features of inflammation. So I think if ultrasound gets gel does get to the meninges, it's not good. But having said that, there are authors that have published real-time interventions describing use of ultrasound sterile ultrasound gel on the patient and saying that we wipe this off um, at the point where the needle is inserted so that none of the gel gets in contact with the needle. But I would ask myself, would I do the, that the same to myself? I think the answer is probably no, because I would not want any of that gel to enter the this sacrosanct space. I think that's a good word. It's a sacrosanct space that you don't want to uh, to breach unless you really have to, with and more importantly, with anything that should not be there. Now, why is ultrasound gel used um, uh, in, in these cases? Yes, when you don't use ultrasound gel, there is some degradation in the quality of the image. And given that you're doing it often in difficult patients, it also becomes quite difficult to visualize the image. We have found that just applying saline to the back and keeping this, the, the back moist uh, does help. Uh, and then all you need to do is just maybe crank up the gain or the, uh, or the dynamic range in the, uh, sorry, the um, time gain compensation in the area of interest. And you can usually overcome this. So we use normal saline uh, as an alternative coupling agent. And over the years, we've had no issues uh, of using it. And the more you use it, the more you become familiar with it. Next is positioning and ergonomics is very important. If you position a patient wrong or you place it in a slightly wrong ergonomics, uh, it's actually failure from the get-go. So what do I mean by that? Now, as we alluded to, the paramedian sagittal oblique view gives you the best window. So this is the paramedian sagittal oblique window with the patient in the lateral position. Now, this is me. I'm right-handed. So I'm using my left hand to perform the scan. So I usually position all my patient in the left lateral position so that I can use my non-dominant hand to perform the scan and then introduce my needle in plane from the caudal end towards the target interlamellar space. You can also position the patient supine as you can uh, uh, sitting in the sitting position. This is, uh, don't worry about the needle insertion here. We are doing a transverse scan and the patient is in the lateral position, the machine is positioned right in front of me so that I can directly see the screen. When you're doing it in the sitting position, it's uh, for a, a right-hand dominant individual, we usually put it on the left-hand side so that you can see uh, the advancement of the needle in real time. When you do position a patient in the lateral decubitus position, it brings into play a non-dominant and a dominant side with respect to the midline and with respect to the neuraxis and the spinal canal. With a, with a right-handed individual like me, I perform the scan with the left hand. So this is the position of the transducer and the needle is inserted in plane from a cordocranial direction, like so, and through the ultrasound image I will show you, using my dominant hand. There are lots of literature showing that if you are a dominant right hand dominant individual and you use your left hand to perform any intervention, the chances of failure is very, very, very high. So that's, uh, you don't need rocket science to show that. But nevertheless, so pay some attention to how you position your patient and where you, um, and how you perform the, sc uh, the scan and the needle. As you can see here, on the strict aseptic precaution, the patient is in the lateral. We are inserting the epidural needle in uh, the caudal end of the transducer with the right paramedian sagittal oblique view. I will come to that. So the needle would appear somewhat like that, and we guide it to the interlamellar space. Or in epidural, we would stop at the level of the ligament and flavum, or somewhere once it's engaged. And then for a spinal, you advance it till you enter the thecal sac. Yes, it is possible to do it from the non -depend from the dependent side because we are doing it from the non-dependent side because it is ergonomically much easier. 
You perform the scan, it's right at the eye level, and it makes your marrying the needle to the ultrasound plane much easier. When you do it from the dependent side, it becomes more ergonomically difficult from, for, for, for the intervention. Now, this is just to illustrate, if you are a right-handed individual and you position your patient in the right decubitus lateral position, you are now forced to use your left hand to perform the needle, unless you are a gymnast and you can position yourself in all kinds of ways to perform the intervention, but this would not be ideal. So <clears throat> pay some attention to how you position your patient in the lateral position with respect to your handedness. You can perform a transverse interspinous scan like so. Uh, although this is not very commonly used to perform in neuraxial intervention, it is our own experience. And there is some published work from, um, from uh, China that now shows that the transverse interspinous scan can be quite useful. As you can see, this is a transverse interspinous view with the articular processes and the thecal sac in the midline. <coughs> Dr. Liu uh, and, and the colleagues from Wuhan in China show that if you perform a transverse interspinous view and you introduce the needle from the non-dependent side, you can see here, this is the non-dependent side, it takes, uh, it, um, it kind of circumvents the problem that right-handed or left-handedness does to you. Now, if the patient is not like so, then I could use, if I'm a right-handed or right left-handed individual, I could still insert the needle with equal dexterity using this transverse scan. So the transverse interspinous view can be quite useful, uh, as you can see here, illustrated by Dr. Liu, how you can perform the scan. He reported a first pass success of close to 95% uh, and a medial needle passes of around two to threes. When you sit the patient up, it's also very comfortable for the patient, but it's not possible clinically to sit all patients up because they may have orthopedic fractures in the lower extremity, et cetera. And some of them are elderly and it's quite difficult to sit them up. You can definitely, in those that you can sit them up, it is maybe desirable. And then you can perform a transverse scan or a sagittal scan, depending on the approach that you would like to use. And we will come to that more. Aseptic precautions is paramount. Now that you are using a new equipment, and you're going to use a new kind of procedure, it's very important to set up aseptic protocols in your department because if you don't follow the set of protocols uh, with respect to this, then there is a very high possibility that you may introduce infection into your patient just because you just did not realize that it happened. <laughs> okay, so here you can see we have prepared the transducer with a sterile sleeve. Now, there's, while the sterile sleeves are useful for uh, maintaining asepsis, but because they are now on the footprint of the transducer, it adds some complexity because unless they are very uh, securely and very well um, secured to the footprint, any crevices or any crumpling may induce artifacts in your ultrasound image. So it can be circumvented uh, by applying some ultra, a thin layer of ultrasound gel on the footprint of the transducer before you apply the um, before you apply this um, plastic sleeve, and there are many in the market today. Well, you can see here this is an aseptic precaution in a relatively good size individual in the sitting position, and we place the machine to the left while my fellow is going to do the procedure. Uh, and he is uh, is a right-handed individual. Okay, let's see how epidural catheterizations can be done. So we do a paramedian sagittal scan, uh, as I alluded to. And the first important thing is to identify the landmark, which interspace you're performing this. So it starts by identifying the lumbosacral junction, as I mentioned to you in my previous talk. And then you count upwards to you find the L3, 4, and 5. And depending on the best visibility of the neuraxial structure, as you can see here, this is probably L4-5, and we can see the posterior dura very clearly, ligamentum flavum. We've chosen this as our target interlaminar space. Now, this is a, a epidural uh, injection. So we now introduce the two-e needle after skin infiltration, just caudal to the transducer, and you advance it till the needle is engaged 
or in the interlamellar spaces and engage at where this is this is the tip and it's very important in the while you're inserting the needle because now the plane is slightly oblique it adds a degree of challenge to your dexterity and being able to uh, visualize this and this i believe is the main challenge uh, for most uh, beginners and i have experienced that but today i'm more experienced so once you get the needle in plane then you uh, advance it till your needle tip is at the ligament of flavum the best place to uh, bring the needle into plane is while the needle is within the erector spinae muscle so you can um, insert and change the uh, orientation of the needle or the trajectory of the needle slightly more medial lat till it uh, till it comes into the plane of your ultrasound beam and once you uh, have the needle in plane don't move the transducer and hopefully you can advance the needle in that till you get to the ligament flavum you'd agree that ultrasound visibility of the epidural space is not as good as you would expect so today i would say that we still have to rely on loss of resistance till you um do to to identify the epidural space so dog leo still lives on so now you can see with the needle engaged on the in the ligament of flavum uh, we are now using a, a syringe which is primed with saline. This is a spring-loaded syringe. Now, this is a picture from many years ago. We don't do that anymore. I will tell you, uh, just to show you what, uh, what this does, then I will talk to you what you really need to do in the real world. So we attach it to the epidural needle, like so. As you can see, the plunger is retracted, and you see there are no locks or devices in this for obvious reasons. And then you advance the needle again in um, in real time until you see forward movement of the plunger and you see changes within the neuraxis. Now, this will loop around, but I like to just <clears throat> mention here that Dogliotti described this in 1933, but these are the first images of what really happens within the neuraxis when you inject normal saline for your loss of resistance. <laughs> Needless to say, you wouldn't want to use air for your loss of resistance because you're using ultrasound. Look what happens to the dura when you um, when you introduce when you insert the needle. Uh, when you get your loss at the moment of truth, if I may use that word. Uh, oops, this has frozen. Okay, it'll hopefully it'll keep looping. You can see that the dura becomes brighter. This is because of post enhancement, and the whole thecal sac, sac gets compressed. So now it is uh, not surprising that when you do sometimes do um, needle through needle CSE, dry taps are not uncommon because your epi your needle, the the needle, the thickle needle, uh, spinal needle that you insert to the uh, to the tuhi needle is not long enough because the dura now has has been uh, displaced anteriorly. So using too much saline during a CSE is not advisable. And certainly, this is for this reason, again, using a spring-loaded syringe is not very good because you have no way of stopping it once you have that moment of truth and your loss of resistance occurs. So the simple way is to, if you you if you, um, hell-bound on using it, then do not use too much saline. Just prime one cc because your objective is to, to detect loss of resistance but not to inject the saline that you have in that loss of resistance syringe. Okay, let's move on. We are running out of time. <laughs> also, you can see here that the needle has been inserted uh, in the CSE from quite a height. We are doing it from the non-dependent side, and you can see the needle come like so into the thecal sac, which is now a little bit compressed, and it's at a height of about three to four centimeters. You can see one, two, three, four centimeters here. So if your CSF pressure is as low as two to three centimeters, you may find that there may be no CSF emerging from the end of the spinal needle. Besides, remember, the thecal sac is not round in the all areas of the lumbar region. I think the shape of the thecal sac also varies from triangular and follows the shape of the spinal canal. <laughs> so there may be lateral deflections of these uh, needle, uh, so therefore missing uh, the true um, dura. Also, uh, the needles we use today are 
of very low, 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 low gauge, fine gauge, that is 25 and 27 gauge needles, which have very high internal resistance. So compounded by the height from the height at which, from which the needle is inserted, uh, all uh, are working in tandem to, to lead to dry taps. Nevertheless, in this case, it was not a dry tap. You successfully aspirate. And in fact, in some individual with the needle within the thecal sac, even you, if you aspirate, you may not always get, get CSF. But we've often uh, performed in, um, spinal injections in these cases, and we've had perfectly good success. And I will present a paper on that shortly. So you place the catheter and uh, you perform, that's your epidural. So I think it's not important to use that spring-loaded syringe. Once you guide your needle to the ligament of flavum, I would just place the transducer down and then use your traditional loss of resistance. And you'll find that your first pass success will be much higher. Uh, and this is uh, true for whether you do it in the thoracic region or you do it in the spinal, uh, you do it in the lumbar region. And we'll talk more about the thoracic another day. So what about spinal injections? This is the last part of my talk. As I alluded to, you can do spinal injections in the sitting or in the lateral position uh, using um, real-time ultrasound guidance, as Dr. Chin has reported in these, in this report. In fact, uh, there was failure in, in, in Dr. Chin's report in, uh, in those difficult patients using Landmark. Therefore, they elected to use ultrasound. Also, I'd like to see the, you to see these images because it illustrates to you uh, what the spinal needle looks like when it has actually entered the uh, interlamellar space. And in this case, with this quality of image, it looks like the needle is actually in the epidural space. Now, this is not a 25-gauge spinal needle. This indeed a 20 gauge, 22 gauge uh, pen, pencil point spinal needle, which is much larger and therefore you can see it much, much clearly. Seeing 25, 27 gauge needles are extremely difficult. So often you have to use surrogate markers like tissue movement to tell you where the needle exactly is. Um, the needle is then advanced and then you enter the thecal sac and you look for your Gold, gold standard loss efflux of CSF. Now, while we think the efflux of CSF is always a simple matter and it would just gush out like you're doing an obstetric spinal, it may not always be true when you're doing an elderly individual or a dehydrated individual, a patient in the lateral position, and you're doing a paramedian sagittal oblique approach for your uh, with an uh, with a in plane approach, like in this case for a spinal, you see I have spoken many words, and it's only now that the CSF has actually refluxed. So the first drop of CSF takes quite a while before it actually emerges from the needle. Now these are actually 25, 27 gauge spinal needles, as Dr. Uh, Shia uh, referred to this paper. We found that in a in a retrospective review of about 113 real-time spinal injections, ultrasound guided spinal using the paramedian sagittal oblique view and the in-plane needle insertion with the patient in the lateral decubitus patient position in a elderly population, we found the incidence was as high as about 10%. In fact, slow if CSF reflux can occur in about 14%. So the cumulative, you would see, in every one in four individual that you perform real time interventions, uh, spinal intervention, that there is some problem with CSF reflux. Now, when I say slow, our cutoff time was three minutes. So some in some cases you had to wait as long as two minutes before I actually saw the CSF reflux. But are you that patient? Often you are not. So you may consider that, that the needle is actually not in the thecal sac. But if you look at it in the ultrasound, often you can detect uh, that the needle is actually within the thecal sac. And in all these cases that we had dry tap, we performed the injection and we had a, a successful spinal anesthesia. <laughs> so there have been um, many suggestions of trying and um, circumventing dry taps with various maneuvers. The sitting position surely may help. But while we think that the CSF reflux with the sitting position uh, may be much, much faster and much quicker, I mean, that would be a logical way to think, but is it really so? We don't know. I think 
Um, there is need for more research in this area, but just to show you that uh, my fellow here is doing a, a preview scan. He's marked out his landmarks. He's done aseptic precaution. He's performing a right-sided paramedian sagittal oblique view. Uh, he's targeting uh, one of the lower lumbar intervertebral spaces, local infiltration. We now using a introducer needle here. The introducer needle actually acts as a surrogate because it's 20 gauge, often larger than the 25 and 27 gauge spinal needles. And they can actually offer you the trajectory at which you can introduce the needle, thus the introducer needle, because it would be shorter and therefore it would be short, fall short of the, uh, of the interlamellar space. And then through it, you insert the spinal needle uh, and then perform the spinal injection. This is just to illustrate to you that the CSF efflux after a spinal puncture with a 25 gauge spinal needle may not be as fast as you think, but it definitely appears to be faster. We've really described that, um, an alternative approach called the transverse in-plane dependent or the TIPD technique. It is a modification of the approach that Dr. Liu described. Uh, and uh, this paper is currently under review. It just um, uses the transverse interspinous view. And then uh, we perform the scan under aseptic precaution. The needle is now inserted from the non-dependent side, as you can see here. The needle is now inserted from a non-dependent to a introducer needle, whereas Dr. Liu introduced from the non-dependent side. We introduce it from the dependent side, beg your pardon. Uh, and while they use it for dexterity, we are trying to propose that this would be a better approach when you're looking at CSF efflux because it's from the dependent side. And you can see here the patient is in the lateral position. We're performing a transverse scan. Also, it's important to remember that this needle is slightly offset from the midline because you don't want to come uh, introduce the needle too far lateral. So therefore, once you get your optimal view, you uh, translate the transverse slightly more towards the non-dependent side, perform your local anesthetic infiltration, and then you insert the introducer needle. Um, aim the introducer needle towards the target. As you can see here, the introducer needle is now being inserted. It's now in the um, erector spinae muscle, and just anterior to this uh, articular process and the facet joint complex. And then you aim for the center of the neuraxial uh, thecal sac. And through this, we would then insert the spinal needle, uh, and the spinal needle would obviously then puncture the thecal sac. And you can see here, we are now testing for the efflux of CSF before you inject the local anesthetic drug as you would normally do. So it's important the introducer is, a, is, a, is an important surrogate because I think just because you're doing a spinal injection, one should not elect to use a larger gauge needle. I think it is a good clinical practice to try and use a finer gauge needle because these are would lead to less post-operative complications uh, as uh, we would expect. Uh, and But however, there are times when it is not possible to do it with 25 gauge uh, or 27 gauge spinal, then surely that's how uh, I practice uh, my spinal injections. I often use lower, finer gauge needles first before I, I use a larger needle. This is a, a video just as interesting because it just shows you what dural tenting looks like when you, at the moment of truth, and you're puncturing the dura. It's described all over the literature. So I thought you may find this interesting. Where you can see there's a slight tenting of the dura anteriorly before it bounces back. So this is uh, just to show you the TIPD technique data. We've used it in a cohort of 30 patients. Uh, successful dural puncture uh, in 29 of the 30. Now, in the one that we failed, uh, there was um, uh, significant ossification of the interspinous um, ligaments. In fact, there were osteophytes <laughs> that precluded to obtaining a good interspinous window. So therefore, just because you do, are wanting to do a TIPD technique, it doesn't mean that the, the anatomy would be would allow you to do so because if you can't get the good TIPD window because of these various factors, then you're not going to be able to perform it. So there are some limitations. So therefore, uh, being aware and being uh, conversant with performing uh, these interventions with either approach should form part of your armamentarium. CSF reflect times were about 22 seconds. I don't know what the normal time is, but this is what it talk, 
we described it as the first drop when it uh, falls off the hub of the needle, that is CSFE flux time. So the Taylor technique is also described. Uh, it's performed through the L5-S1 gap. And as my previous colleagues uh, alluded to, it's a large inter interlamellar space and it's much closer to the skin. And you can perform an injection very easily through this. It's also described as the largest interlamellar space. I think I would like um, later on during the Q&A, um, Kenneth and uh, uh, Professor Morrigal also to comment a little bit as to the relative sizes of the interlamellar spaces and is it that the L5-S1 is the largest because it's often described in the literature. Um, and it's often um, uh, used for, even for landmark-based technique, but it's rarely used for central neuraxial blocks or in uh, regional anesthesia when you're using it for anesthesia. And this is an important space because when your chips are down and you have difficult patients, even with patients with, skull, uh, with previous instrumentation or previous inflammation, and as I will show you, that uh, the L5-S1 seems to be rarely involved. I don't know why. Maybe this is God's grace for us anesthesiologists to be able to still perform spinal injections. I've often found it so. <laughs> and you will find that the Harrington rods are never fixed on the sacrum. So the L5-S1 usually is open. So the prone position L5-S1 <coughs> can be performed. And I showed you these images previously. I won't go back into it. Uh, the L5-S1 gap is very easily identifiable. And then you can perform the scan. It's again, the L5-S1 space is much closer to the skin. It's just a paramedian sagittal window. Uh, and uh, it's being a wide space, it can very easily uh, be used. You can also use the transverse view to perform, uh, to identify the L5-S1. And now in some individuals, you may not be able to do a paramedian sagittal scan, say for whether they've had laminectomies or they've had previous uh, spine surgery for some reason. If you can't do so, then the transverse view is also an alternative approach. In these series of images, you will see this is the median sacral crest. So this is the sacrum, the sacroiliac joints and the iliac crest. So this is the erector spinae muscle. As you go more proximally uh, or cranially, you will see the sacral image disappears, shadow disappears, and you can see the anterior complex of the L5-S1 gap with the lateral pillars of the articular processes. So these are also reflect uh, that the uh, the L5-S1 uh, space here with the, with the thecal sac, and then you can, as you keep continue, you'll see the L5, the L4-5 into space, the L4, L3-4, etc. <laughs> We uh, actually performed a study where, uh, with this group from um, from Thailand, where we we compared landmark based palpation of the to the primary outcome was to identify the L4 spinous process compared to palpation compared to ultrasound. When we we uh, use fluoroscopy as the gold standard, we found that ultrasound was more accurate than palpation, even with using the transverse scan. So this can be a useful alternative if you can't use the sagittal view. Uh, furthermore, I think uh, a last few words is that when you have difficult spine, um, don't turn your back on the patient because today there is technology available. Uh, and um, Kenneth Chia has shown you that how well you can use the CT on an MRI, a CT data to uh, render these images in your PAC system, in your operating room, and plan your procedure and identify the best interlamellar space, as you can see here in this patient with ankylosing spondylysis in our operating theater. You can see we can uh, identify the L5-S1 while well, the inflammatory process actually <coughs> uh, has occluded most of the other uh, interlamellar spaces. So we plan the spinal through this, and this is a real-time ultrasound in this ankylosing spondylitic patient. You can see, voila, the L5-S1 just appears here and the spinal was accurately performed through the L5-S1 into space with success. However, when you perform, <coughs> beg your pardon. <coughs> Maybe I've spoken too much. So when you perform these through the <coughs> L5-S1 gap, because of the presence of the coda equina, uh, paresthesia may be 
uh, relatively higher in this individual. Also, dry tap may not be uncommon because I'm in the belief that, believe that because the thecal sac narrows at the L5S1, the spinal canal narrows at the L5S1, and if the thecal sac is filled with the coda equina nerves, then when you place a needle at the L5S1, there is very little CSF. And I also like to hear what the other speakers uh, have to say with respect to this. Okay, with these few words, I hope I have illustrated to you, ladies and gentlemen, how you can use ultrasound to perform ultrasound imaging of the lumbar spine. I've also shown you how you can use it to perform real-time interventions. Remember that ultrasound can also be very useful as a pre-interventional tool to do perform pre-procedural scan. So it's not always necessary to do a real-time scan, but I remember that when you do real-time interventions, dry taps are not uncommon. And if you're aware of this phenomenon, then uh, and you can confirm sonographically that your needle is in the thecal space, then injecting local anesthetic in these cases, like we did, would often lead to success.